you know, if you're a company, you're a business, uh, and you're not paying attention to hiring the, the neurodivergent, catering to the neurodivergent, uh, selling the neurodivergent, making it, it a better place for the neurodivergent to work, you are uh, severely limiting what your company can do. You're listening to episode 19 of the Happy Space podcast, where today I explore reframing ADHD with the man with the faster brain, Peter Shankman. Welcome to the Happy Space podcast, where we talk about designing inclusive performance through the lens of a highly sensitive productivity catalyst. Uh, that's me, executive coach, speaker, and brand collaborator, Claire Kumar. Join conversations with authors, culture shapers, space designers, and creators of products, services, and customer experience as we highlight astonishing contributions tempting a more tender world. We know that diversity leads to richer results, so let's accept that productivity is personal and commit to designing with respect for humanity. I aim to leave you with ideas to better support your family, colleagues, customers, community, and not least of all, yourself. For everyone, including you, deserves a happy space. Well, you're in for a treat today. I am thrilled to have Peter Shankman joining me for a deep dive into understanding the value of the neurodivergent brain, how uh, it's to be celebrated, how to deal with some of the strengths and challenges. It's something that Peter's been looking at for a number of years since he wrote a Faster Than Normal several years ago, and more recently, The Boy with the Faster Brain. And you'll hear in this interview, Peter is the man with the faster brain. The ideas and thoughts come tumbling out, and I, and I hope you'll enjoy them. He's the, the five-time best-selling author and on main stages talking about, oh, his vision for business, inclusivity. Um, he's, he's got the pulse. You'll see him on, on news uh, numerous times. You'll see him as a brand ambassador for different brands as well. He's insightful, um, brilliant. I hope you really enjoy the conversation that I had with the incredible Peter Shankman. Thank you so much for joining me, Peter. I've followed your work for a long time and had the pleasure of meeting you many years ago at the NAPO conference. This was when you were speaking to the productivity and organizing professionals. Yep. Yep. And uh, I've followed you and been really thrilled, not only because of your expertise as an entrepreneur. I think I got onto Fast Company magazine with an interview because of Harrow, oh, which, great. yeah, yeah. But also because you've been a real ambassador in the space of ADHD in particular. And it's there's ADHD in my family. And as many organizing and productivity professionals, you would know, we work with a lot of clients with organization and cognitive challenges, right? So um, I, uh, I've been appreciative of that and wanted to get your perspective as someone who's in this conversation, and I think embraces a message, which I do, that neurodiversity and neurodivergent ways of being really need to be celebrated. And I think that's where I'd love to start this conversation is give me your perspective on the value of neurodivergent ways of being. Um, how do you see it? And the easiest way to put it is imagine having a, uh, you're driving a Honda Accord for the first 15 years of your life. And then um, all of a sudden someone tells you, you know, hey, you had enough of that Accord. Here's a Lamborghini. Um, if you try to drive that Lamborghini the same way you're driving the Honda Accord, you're going to rev up to go on the highway and you're going to go 200 miles an hour and you're going to crash into a tree and destroy the car by yourself. But if you know how to use um, that faster car, if you know how to drive that faster Lamborghini, you can do things that people with regular cars cannot do. And that is sort of the beauty of neurodivergence is that once you understand um, your talents and you understand where your skills lie, and more importantly, you understand how to access those skills while dismissing the parts that aren't good for you, you can pretty much do whatever you want. Um, you know, it's no, it's no coincidence that, that without knowing without being diagnosed as ADHD, I was able to start and sell three companies. Um, 
when I finally got diagnosed, everything started making a lot more sense. And I was able to even improve on that. But mm-hmm. a lot of it comes from the fact that we spend, most people who are neurodivergent have spent a good portion of their lives uh, being told they're broken and being told they don't fit in and being told the things they do are not appropriate or the case may be. And um, that's really what I'm trying to help prevent and, and stop. But, um, you know, if you're a company, you're a business, uh, and you're not paying attention to hiring the, the neurodivergent, catering to the neurodivergent, uh, selling to the neurodivergent, making it, it a better place for the neurodivergent to work, you are uh, severely limiting what your company can do. Yeah. So you nail the business imperative right there, you know, brilliant minds. And we can look to examples in society, right? You're, you're one. Look at Richard Branson and dyslexia. Look at, I mean, look at, look at, look at this, the founders of this country. You're going to tell me that people with regular brains decided one day, okay, we're probably going to get killed for this, but I have an idea. What if we take a boat, go over there, hmm. right? And we'll just like start another country, right? No big deal, right? I mean, it's not, it's not, you know, yeah, we'll probably get killed, but it could, could be fun. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it the list goes on and on, right? You don't, it you does. don't start companies. You don't, sh- when I, when I started Help Reporter Out, uh, I was told by many people, even, uh, I was told the PR Newswire had something called uh, ProfNet and, you know, there's no way that I could ever compete with ProfNet and, and they tried, PR Newswire even threatened to sue me. Um, and oh, yes, wow. my company was acquired by Cision, who is now owned by, uh, or Vocus is now owned by Cision and Cision yeah. is part owner of PR Newswire. So all things come around. <laughs> um, you know, yeah. it, it, but it, it's, it's that, it's that premise of, of having a brain that just says, no, nah, why not? What's what's going to happen? Mm. You know, it's, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. And I come from that view too, that there's so much to be celebrated, but I want to anchor for just a second in the fact that there is a lot of shame. There's a lot of people with ADHD who are misinterpreted as being lazy, for example, and, and not engaged and don't care. Yeah. And that is, that is not how I view it. Um, but that is that is a bit of the burden that a lot of people and it's even include in there the people that don't have a diagnosis and can begin to sort of unlock and at least from a self-awareness uh, place come to approach a better understanding of all that that it means. But so what do you say to someone who's had that misperception now and is carrying the shame? How do they find their voice? Because I heard your confidence in there of let's go try it like this, you know, this. Where did that spirit in you come from that kind of broke through that message of being broken? Today's episode of the Happy Space podcast is sponsored by ClaireKumar.com. With sensitivity, curiosity, and courage, I serve three groups asking the tough questions that lead to meaningful answers. Number one, I coach ambitious leaders to design for well-being and achieve next-level work-life integration. Number two, I mic drop thought bombs, that's bombs as in B-A-L-M-S, in keynotes and workshops, helping organizations achieve the business imperative that is inclusivity. And three, I collaborate with brands concerned with respect for well-being on product design, marketing, and PR. If any of this piqued your interest, come find me at clairekumar.com. I'd love to speak with you. Designing inclusive performance together will lead to the richest results. If you'll pardon the, the, the expression, it, it came from finally one day waking up and no longer giving a shit about what anyone else thought. Mm-hmm. Um, I spend, we spend a really lot of, large amount of our time trying to impress people that we have absolutely no need to impress whatsoever, um, whether it's coworkers or employees or friends or whatever. And one of the things I learned, and it took a long time to learn it, you know, maybe, maybe I learned it 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so it took 40 years to learn was that there are very few people in this world that matter um, in, in the grand scheme of things. And, um, you know, that you're not trying to impress social media is a waste of time, trying to impress people that don't pay your rent or pay your mortgage or somehow impact your life more than just pixels on screen is really pointless. Um, right now, I have a, a nine-year-old kid in the other room and I have a two-year-old dog. And them and both my parents are pretty much the ones I need to impress. And that's about it. Uh, my girlfriend, or dad, her. but you know, other than that, um, I, I don't really give a damn. I, I am living my life. I'm having a really good time doing it. And um, it's not my uh, problem what you may or may not think of me. Right. And it, like I said, took a long time to figure that out, but it really isn't. It's what, what, what someone else thinks of me is none of my concern. Do you think something 
got you there? Was there a particular incident or you just woke up one day and it kind of all came together? Was I think it something? all came together. I mean, I grew up oh. constantly trying to, you know, impress. I had an ex-girlfriend once who told me that, that, that one of the reasons we broke up was because my, she felt like my life was the Peter, you know, dating me was like living in the Peter Shankman show, all Peter all the time. And I realized what you meant by that was that it was really hard for me to, to, I was always concerned. What would she think about me? What would she, would she, you know, doing the right thing? Is she impressed with me or whatever? So I'd always, you know, overdo it and always try to make too much of it and try to, you know, own the show or whatever. And she was right. It was, you know, no one wants to move something like that. And, and eventually I just, when you realize you can just be yourself. And that's the other thing. You be yourself and the people who are supposed to be in your life will stay and the people who aren't will fall away. And there's nothing greater than that. You know, you ever, you ever get, um, you know, you slice your leg or you cut your leg, skin your knee or whatever, and you get that huge scab and you just want to pick it, you want to pick it, but you don't. And finally one day you wake up and it falls off and it's brand new pressure skin about it. That's kind of like what it's like. When I'm you waiting for that. that Did you yeah, notice you, I sliced you part of my finger off? I'm waiting That'll for that. <laughs> but when you realize that most, most of the people in your life are kind of like scabs, if they fall away, there's a reason for that. That's a good thing. When, when people show you their, who they really are, you got to let them. Right. And, and mm. what, what I found is that, is that, you know, and it's not always easy, but it is always worth it. Um, the premise of just allowing yourself to be who you are and do what you want and and the real people who who are your tribe the real people who believe in you the real people who like you for who you are they're going to show up you can't prevent them from showing up. they will show up and and those are the people you want to hang out on to and everyone else just let them go you're making me reflect on my 23 relationship and i think i suspect some level of adhd i look at it as a, a continuum but not knowing it i turned into the parent in the relationship yeah. And not. without an awareness, I think one of the things I love about what you're doing is raising awareness because yeah, I, I, yeah, find your people and surround yourself with people who are there to support you. But in a relationship with someone where I think ADHD is present and no awareness or even like ability to have language to come together and go, oh, I get what's going on here and here's how I can support you. I think there's such richness in being able to, not from a label point of view, but from an understanding self and helping others understand and support us better. I think yeah. there's something powerful on that. What would you say, can you describe your own journey? And in, in you said you got a diagnosis and then it's, you know, that was helpful. Can you share a little bit more maybe with that perspective? Getting the diagnosis was, was great and was helpful, but it's also in the respect that like, when you break your knees, right? And you, you know, you, or when you break your leg and you know, you broke your leg, right? It's like, oh, look, my leg's broken. The bone's sticking out. You don't really need a diagnosis because your leg is broken, but right. it's good to go to a doctor and get it set. Um, it was sort of the same thing with my ADHD. I knew I had ADHD. It was, it's, it's, you know, everything I read uh, finally, you know, 20 years earlier, I, I finally knew. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, wasn't, it wasn't like, oh, wow. What do you mean I have it? Duh, of course I do. It was so, no surprise, right? But to get it, to get it from a doctor, and to know that if I want it, there's medication. Uh, mm -hmm. If I just want to continue doing what I'm doing, I can do that too. You know, it helped. It helped a little bit just to put a name to it, but it didn't affect my life in the respect of like, oh, wow, I have to change everything. I had already changed everything. I was already doing things differently to yes. begin with that, that allowed yeah. me to, to live the life I have. So yeah, so, yeah. so, so the premise of getting, uh, being aware of it and having a name, sure, is, is beneficial, right? You know, yeah. it, but it's, it's, I was never, I promised myself right from the beginning, I was never going to blame my ADHD, I would never blame anything on my ADHD. I was never going to do anything like that. So for me, it was, um, it was just easy enough to, you know, let me figure out how to get through it. Yeah. I mean, and you talk a lot about that in Faster Than Normal, which was um, your first book about ADHD, if, um, although you've written uh, their business books beforehand. Um, and I tell, I don't know if you know this, but I tell in many of my presentations, your story about getting, going to bed with your gym clothes on. Yeah. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. I wear my, I wear my gym clothes. I go to sleep when I wake up in the morning. I just, I, I walk two inches to my left and I'm on the bike. And you know, it, it, it if I have to think about it, chance I'm not going to do it. So mm -hmm. to be able to do something like that is, is tremendously beneficial because again, it's, it's figuring out ways to remove extraneous, extraneous possibilities. Um, removal of choice is incredibly big. And if yeah. I can get rid of the choice, I'm already dressed gym clothes. I might as well get on the bike, you know, as opposed to thinking about it and then coming up with a reason not to do it. Yeah. Um, it's the same reason that I have a uniform. I have, I have, um, uh, my, 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 
closet is labeled, has two sides to it. It says office slash travel as t-shirt and jeans or, or speaking and slash TV and it's button down shirt, jacket and jeans. And that's it. My suits, my vests, my sweaters are all in my daughter's closet because if I had to wake up every morning or not, that sweater. I remember that sweater. I'll argue me that sweater. I wonder how she's doing. It's, um, you know, three, three hours later, I'm naked in the living room on Facebook and I left the house. So it's, you know, to be able to avoid that again, yeah. ignore, ignore the extraneous. Yeah. And you came to these, you have n- numbers of suggestions and strategies that people can employ. You came to these on your own. They just evolved. Um, I, I consider myself someone who figured out organization strategies to calm my world down. You talk about valuing a clean and simple environment. So it's also not pulling you in 50 directions at once. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. It really is. It really does work. I'm curious whether in your realm, because you've helped many people with ADHD and you think about this a lot, do you see that? I see a lot of people with ADHD struggling with a lack of structure and perhaps some of these practices, which they've identified to really support themselves. Do you think there's something special in in the way you are and your curiosity that's given you a drive to create order? Or is can you can you speak to that a little bit? I think um, for me, it's understanding that if I have order and the less chaos, the more order I can create. And so the less I have the ability to, because uh, if, I, if I have chaos, if I look around and say, oh man, look at that, all that means I should clean that. Well, I'm doing that, right? And I'm not focusing yeah. on what I was supposed to be focusing on. And so, so uh, it always comes down to um, what can you do that eliminates the need to look over there or stare at that shiny thing or yeah. lose track of where you are. And, and yeah. that could be something as simple as hiring someone to clean your apartment. Or, you know, if you can't afford that, trading with someone where you clean someone else's apartment, they clean yours because it's more exciting now. Something to do that that allows you to sit down, go to work. Yeah. I mean, your, your incredible example is booking a flight. So you're mm-hmm. in, in a seat and you, there's nowhere else you're going to go. Uh, and get a, get a book written in what, under 31 hours, 32 hours or something like that. Something like that. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. So that, I think that self-awareness and your drive is something I, I remark on. And and wait, I appreciate that. I mean, the drive, the drive comes simply because what you're doing, if you love what you're doing and you're in the best possible place, way, mental, mental state to do it, you're going to rock it. You know, yes. and so the key is you find the things that you're great at. You, 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 and you give, you find the things you're great at and you do those. And then you give yourself the best possible chance to survive and get through the things you're not great at, things you don't love. Um, you know, if I know that I have a day full of meetings, maybe that's a day that I do take um, a, a medication, right? I, mm-hmm. But more often than not, I can use my, um, I can use exercise and, and things like that to get through. So it's all yeah. about knowing yourself. Yeah. And designing, I talk about designing for well being. And so mm-hmm. if you understand yourself, then you can give yourself the day, the structure that you need to bounce. I think, you know what? I had three meetings in a row this morning already. And I had a nightmare last night about having three meetings in a row. Somehow my ex was involved in getting me there and getting us way late. So I wasn't getting to the meeting. I hadn't structured my day properly and, my, and I lived it even before I'm living it. And it's all no turned out to be five. fine because I built in a break. I said to yeah, my last meeting... To. I need to get ready for Peter. So I, I need a few minutes to, to do that. So yeah, it's, and it's a continual. Um, it's con- a constant process. You're always going to, it's always yeah. a process. You're always going to be, um, uh, you know, it, it's not something that just goes away, right? In a lot of ways, yeah. it's similar to, to quitting drinking or, or any kind of um, addiction in the respect that yeah. just because you've done it doesn't mean you don't have to think about it anymore. You constantly have to be aware of it. Otherwise, yes. it can it can hurt you. Come back and bite you in the ass. Yeah, truth, truth, absolutely. There. When we're thinking of organizations and companies that have a huge opportunity to be more neuro inclusive, here one of the opportunities I see, and I wonder if you've thought about this or come across it in any way, is that there's very little opportunity for rest and recovery in a busy workplace. The open concept office for me, I can't, I can't even like forget it. And then I remember being third trimester of pregnancy, crawling under my desk and lying (laughs) on the floor because I just needed somewhere to be horizontal. 
Yep. Are you seeing anything there? Is that come up for you as a thought about rest and recovery as a as a coping strategy during a workday? Yeah, I mean, there are definitely companies that are putting in uh, blue rooms and relaxed rooms and things like that. But you know, the, it 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 lends itself to a bigger picture. The things that some companies are doing, that Google is doing, that things like that Morgan Stanley are doing, things like that, they're not doing them. They're doing them for the benefit of those who are neurodiverse. But but it's a curb cut situation, and and I'll explain that. Back in World War II, you had about 600,000 veterans come back who were injured uh, to the United States and after the war. And the government decided to force all cities to create curb cuts, which are these um, ramps at the end of every uh, block. Yes. And what wound up happening is the curb cuts not only helped the veterans, but they helped pregnant women. They helped mm -hmm. mothers. They helped small children. They helped the disabled. Yeah. They helped the elderly. It was something that was done for one class of people that then... Uh, worked and benefited every class of people. And so what companies are realizing once they implement these things for the neurodiverse is that they are incredibly beneficial to everyone. It is a mental health issue more than anything else that if you give someone a, a room space that is just, hey, if you need 15, 20 minutes, take a chill, go, go for it, no one will bother you, that benefits right? the company as a whole. And you know, I worked with a company, a very, very big company that, that um, to create uh, benefits to the neurodiverse, they, we created, um, it was an open, a hot office policy. And so basically you come in, if you work three days a week in the office, you come in, you can choose any desk. You put your right. laptop in it. They say, so hot office or hot desk policy. And um, mm -hmm. what they did was they created zones um, uh, in their offices where they had a red zone, uh, yellow zone, green zone. Red zone meant leave me the hell alone. I need to focus. Yellow zone was bother me if it's important. Green zone was, hey, I'm open. Talk to me. And right. what wound up happening is, is you'd think everyone would just go into a red zone all day and then never leave you know, every single day. But yeah. what wound up happening was that they'd go into the red zone the first day they were there. They'd get so much accomplished. That by the second day, they could be in the yellow zone, and by the third day, they'd be in the green zone. And yes. so it actually increased productivity as a whole throughout the entire company. Because all of a sudden, yes. you were giving people a way to work that allowed them to be the most productive they were. And they were, they were doing two, three, four times the productivity just yes. by being themselves. And this works for both neurodiverse and non-neurodiverse. So that's really a benefit as well. Yeah, I love the connection to curb cuts. It's actually designed for the means and you benefit, or the extremes, you benefit the means. That, yep. that kind of concept, right? Yeah. 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 Um, I want to talk for a second about education at schools because I know you give talks um, and you're, you know, you have a nine-year-old daughter now, so you're thinking about education yep. and opportunity. Who has been suspiciously quiet. Jess, everything okay? Everything good? Okay. Everything. Okay, excellent. Um, I've had some challenges with post-secondary university and the expectation that, you know, 17, 18-year-old young adults are going to be able to self-advocate when they've been in an, an environment where they've been getting support from different areas. And all of a sudden they go to school. I, I went to the university with one of my kids and they said to me, mom, you've, this is the last time we'll be speaking to you. But they didn't say, you know, how have you been supported? So to the student, how have you been supported? How are we going to help you recreate that? What do you need? They just said, you're no longer invited to this conversation. And I'm, I'm wondering what you sense, ah, the question here is, what do you sense is reasonable in terms of, A, I think building self-efficacy is always what, something we want to encourage and being able to be able to ask and feel safe about it. With the shame that I was talking about, somebody might have come feeling very broken, had, having supports and now coming into a, a new area with that shame. How do we, how do we navigate this need for self self-advocacy, and also designing what I call an inclusive um, performing environment where we're inviting that safety and encouraging people to, you know, encourage leaders to understand what people need. Do you have any thoughts on education in particular and what we're seeing? I think that, that it's difficult for, you know, I give teachers a lot of credit. It's really, really hard for them to create, um, you know, essentially two sets of, of working you know, ways. You know, you have, you have, um, kids with non-neurodiverse brains and then you have um, you have kids with their diverse brains and so if, if you know if it's 30 to 3 right it's difficult to get them to sort of oh well let me just do this one or whatever it's hard to do that and I think that one of the one of the things I've learned is that yeah uh, you don't necessarily need to change everything you mm -hmm. can create um uh, You can create pathways for neurodiverse and non-neurodiverse where, you know, again, just like my daughters, when, when they get, um, 
when any kid in her school has the has the ability has the right to stand up and go to the back of the room and you know do some spots or walk around or do whatever they want if they feel like mm-hmm. they need to mm-hmm. um no that's the uh that's the uh the easiest way to do it right you're creating a, a pathway for the neurodiverse kids to be able to be in the class to not have to feel ostracized or whatever just Say, hey, guys, if anyone gets a little, uh, if anyone's attention span starts running or whatever, you need yeah. a break, go to, the, go to the back of the room, stand up, drink some water, whatever yeah. you need. Go yeah. do it. Letting everyone yeah. do that doesn't yes. single out anyone and makes it a lot easier. Yeah, 100%. It's the same thing with note taking. I mean, you know, just offering, for example, anybody who needs the notes, we're going to make that service something we provide in education now, recognizing that I use the hashtag quite a lot now, productivity is personal, but we process differently. so. I think it's about options. I think it's about presenting the options, inviting whoever needs to take them. Then we get away from never mind the labels. We, we don't have to look for a diagnosis. We just say, here, there's options. And we understand that everyone's going to be different. Yes, we have to not distract each other. So yeah, walking at the back of the room is probably a better idea than walking across the front of, front of the room. But yeah, we have to, uh, we have to go that way. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the Google NEU project. Um, do they say new? Do they call it that? Uh, or new, yeah. New. A new project, yeah. Um, so I stumbled across it, and then I found you were involved when you posted on social media you were going to their event, and I was like, yes, we need that, yeah. that voice there. The speaker there, the speaker there was great. Amazing. So for, for listeners, um, and they're going to be coming on to talk about it um, in particular, but I wanted your perspective on what you see happening there, because you, you know better than I do what the initiative is, and the difference that it's aiming to make. It's the, maybe you can explain it a little bit and then um, what you see as the opportunity there for businesses to, to learn from. Well, I mean, just the premise that a company as big as Google understands that there is an entire community out there that's being underserved um, is phenomenal, right? And that yeah. they're willing to, to, to host a conference and host an event and host a, an actual group within Google to, to focus on this is, is, is huge. And we're seeing, again, we're seeing more and more other companies are doing very similar things. They're, they're creating their own groups within, within the, the companies to try and create these things. And the premise is very simple, that, that the more you can benefit a certain group, the more you can benefit everyone. And yeah. why not, right? Literally, where is yeah. the downside? Yeah, it's, uh, it's something I observed, you know, studying. Uh, I studied with the Institute on Challenging Diverse Organization. We have some of the thought leaders uh, in the world on, on neurodivergence, ways of being, chronic disorganization, all of that. Everything that I learned, I ha- this is this is helping everybody. This I call it putting the right tension in the trampoline, getting mm-hmm. the right amount of structure you need so you can bounce appropriately, so you don't hit the ground and you you don't take off into space. So it's it's um, I think all of the strategies that help someone neurodivergent help everybody. So I love that point. What I want to come to now is really celebrating your latest uh, book, which I have here, "The Boy with the Faster Brain." And I would, I just, I want to celebrate it. The art, the, um, the illustrations are adorable. They're, they, they really capture, they really capture the spirit beautifully. And I love that you brought in the conversation with the doctor to sort of normalize talking about it and also seeking more information to understand it. Tell me a little bit about where the inspiration for this book came and what your hopes for it are. Everyone told me to write a kid after Fast and Normal. Everyone said you should really write a kid's book. And so, um, you know, in perfect ADHD fashion, I waited five years, then wrote a kid's book. But I think that more than that, it was really about the premise that I see um, there are a lot more resources today. And mm-hmm. as many resources there are, uh, kids are still not necessarily getting those resources. Um, and the workplace in the same way. Uh, 64% of companies are increasing mental health uh, budgets, yet only 19 to 20, I think 26% of employees are taking advantage of them. So the resources are starting to get there, which is great. It's exactly what we want. Now we have to teach the parents and kids and adults that you can go take advantage of them. And so when I was growing up, you know, ADHD didn't exist. It's just would sit down, you're disrupting the class disease. And today, you know, it, it, is, it is not, you know, even if you finally get diagnosed, which didn't happen to me as a kid, you finally get diagnosed, doesn't, it's not this death sentence. It's not this, oh my God, my kid's broken. It's like, wow, my kid has a different brain and he can learn yeah. how to use that better and is actually a good thing. And so the premise yeah. behind the book is teaching his 10 year old Peter comes home every day, gets in trouble. Here's a note from the teacher. Here's a note from the teacher. He's making jokes in class. He's causing trouble. 
and he gets diagnosed uh, with uh, from a wonderful uh, doctor named Dr. Lisa, and he's yeah. finally able to to understand that wow, his brain is faster; it moves at like warp nine, like Star Trek. And he, if he knows how to drive it, he he can do amazing things, and that's exactly what happens. Yeah. So it's a great, it's a book of understanding and possibility. Um, no question about it, and and yeah. and understanding possibility, and and I'd say even a step further, um, letting kids know that they're not alone. Um, the number of parents who have reached out to me in the two weeks, two and a half weeks since this book launched, uh, and have said, so I read this to my kid, la- to my kid last night, and within three pages, uh, he jumped up and shouted, oh my God, that's me. It's yeah. just, yeah, loving it, loving yeah. it. Yeah, goose, oh man, goose, serious, chills, yeah. Yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, the Faster Than Normal book is is designed for for who? Is there an age group? This is, this is. I'd say seven to 12 to 13, but on the flip side, um, you know, I got parents who tell me that their high school kids are reading it. I, got I love it. Me, so yeah, it's it's. I think it's for I think it's for everyone. It's it's a feel good story, but it, it is a lot really autobiographical for yes. a lot. You know, for me of um I, the difference being that I didn't get diagnosed. So so the fact that kids can today is is wonderful. Well, kid can I still say diagnosis is privilege though because it can be very expensive to get through you know through a system with benefits and so on. Or it could take very long in, in the public system if there is, is, is something. And I, I mean, I think that further, I hate the term diagnosis. You know, you get diagnosed yes. with cancer. Getting diagnosed yes. with, with ADHD. I've never gotten diagnosed with, you know, a supermodel wanting to go out with me or with no winning the lottery. You get diagnosed <laughs> with bad things. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing. I agree, too. I agree, too. And we talk about it a lot. Neurodivergence is about different ways of being, not necessarily <laughs> disorder. There are situations, and I do want to acknowledge that there are times when the different conditions can feel very debil- debil- debilitating. Yep. There, are, I look at it as strengths and struggles. That there, are, you know, I'm highly sensitive, which is a trait that affects about twenty percent of people. And it's wonderful because we notice. I call myself the chief noticer. We notice everything. At the same time, noticing everything is freaking exhausting, and um, we can be easily overwhelmed. We're the fastest to burn out. So we need all of this self-awareness to be able to navigate and sustain performance. So it's, it's understanding. And I think you've, you've offered two now books on the topic. What's, what's coming up for you um, in the future? Because I know that th- these, these projects take a while. And uh, what, what are you sensing on your horizon in this space and beyond, what what's uh, what's lighting you up right now? I definitely like to do a. a, a I like to work. I'm working with a an author, a female author, to uh, potentially do a girl with a faster brain type book, um, yeah. which would be great. I can't do it alone. Um, and then uh, hope definitely another. It's funny. I wanted to do a follow up to Faster Than Normal last year, but um, my publisher told me that I wasn't allowed to because um, uh, I'm I the book is still doing very well. I'm like so I'm 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 getting in trouble for doing really well. She goes exactly. I'm like no, oh, doesn't seem very fair, but. Um, you know, I, I'm hopeful at some point that I can do a, uh, another another uh, another fast and normal. That's in fact why Boy with Faster Brain was self published because um, I want it to be uh, I want it to be um, you know as free to do as much as I want with it. Yeah, well, I, they, I think they're complementary, not competing, if you will. So um, I'm excited to see what else you come up with. I'm excited to follow the influence that you're having. Uh, you you celebrate that neurodiversity is is beautiful. It's uh, an amazing strength to have that people are not broken, and um, stop caring what other people think. Those are all you know messages that I've heard loud and clear today that I know are important to you. Is there anything else that you'd want to say to someone now who's listening that that maybe thinks their brain is a little different? Is is sort of wondering. What, how should I, I say do it, this? do it, do what works for you, right? If you want to get tested, know for sure, go for it. If you're surviving and doing great and thriving the way you are, go for that too. There's no, yeah. there's no rules here, right? Just, just yeah. do what works for you the best. Yeah. I love it. Peter, thanks so much for spending time with me. Pleasure was my class. This is great. Thank you so much. Bye. Um, wishing you an awesome day. Rest of your week. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening. You can find all of the Happy Space Podcast episodes over at happyspacepod.com. That is also where you'll find a link to our online community. Please leave a review over at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you tune in. And if you liked what you heard, please share. After all, doesn't everyone deserve a happy space?